Today, I'm going to talk about introduction to metagenomics. And my focus today is really going to be on setting up some of the theoretical background to provide context for the practicals that you'll do later in the course. All right, so first off, let's talk about what is a metagenome. Let's get some of our terms defined here. So a metagenome is the collection of genomes and genes from the members of a microbiota. This collection is obtained through shotgun sequencing of DNA extracted from a sample, so metagenomics, followed by either mapping to reference database or de novo assembly, followed by annotation. The microbiota is an assemblage of microorganisms present in a defined environment. And a microbiome refers to the entire habitat, including the microorganisms, their genomes, and the surrounding environmental conditions. This is important. These, uh, these terms are defined um, specifically in 2015 in a, in a really important paper by, by Marchese and Ravel. Uh, called the vocabulary of microbiome research. And you might wonder, you know, why do we need an entire article just on vocabulary? Um, it turns out it's actually really important. So before 2015, when it comes to the microbiome and when it comes to metagenomics, we had a complete terminology wild west. Terms were being used with no fixed definition, often to mean quite different things. And there is extremely high confusion in the literature in most of the articles before 2015. So you'll see that metagenomics is used to mean different things. What people define as a microbiome can refer to very different things. So just keep that in mind when you're reading the literature, that there's this kind of historic shift that happens around 2015. Prior to that, the terms are not, don't have fixed definitions and often have multiple different definitions that wasn't even fully understood by everyone who was using them. And it only really comes together um, with a definition in 2015. So yeah, so why did we need this article about vocabulary? The terminology also in general around microbes is a mess. So if you've been in this field for any amount of time, you will realize that the way that we name microbes, describe microbes, talk about them and their evolution is extremely messy. And we'll go into some of those reasons in a minute. But understanding this will be really helpful as you build upon these concepts to try to do your work, which is trying to understand the, the uh, evolutionary relationships of different microbes and how communities change. So the term metagenome was originally coined by uh, Jo Handelsman in 1988, but she meant it as something very different than how we use the term today. So the term as she originally defined it is actually different than how we use that term today. Um, originally, metagenomics um, took on a couple of different meanings. In several early studies, you'll see that it's used to refer to 16S ribosomal RNA amplification. But today, we no longer describe this as metagenomics. Instead, we call that metataxonomics to, just to distinguish between simply um, looking at a single gene versus looking at entire genomes. The term microbiome itself uh, is... There are claims uh, that has that has been coined multiple times. So it's been coined at least two times, um, each meaning something different. So uh, in one case, it was coined as a kind of combination of the words microbial and biome, meaning a microbial community. And that definition was set in 1988. It was also then re kind of recoined again to mean a microbiota ohm. Um, uh, referring to the collective genomes of a microbiota. So you'll also see this kind of confusion in the literature um, prior to 2015, where it might refer to an environment and a community, or it might refer to a metagenome. You see both definitions being used. But actually the term microbiome is really old and it's been used and coined and redeveloped multiple times. And the earliest uh, example of it that I can find and use dates actually to 1894. So this concept of combining the small with an environment, the micro with a biome, is an actually really old one that people have hit upon multiple times. So you'll see it in the literature and many different cases with a lot of different definitions. But since 2015, we now as a field have agreed to use this standardized vocabulary uh, that was defined by Marchesi and Ravel. So this is what we're gonna move forward here. All right, so let's talk a little bit about ancient metagenomics. What is ancient metagenomics? 
So ancient metagenomics is the study of the collection of genes and genomes of the microbiotas within a given environment or microbiome, plus all of the other DNA that is mixed in. So basically, we use it to refer to all of the DNA in a sample. A key point here is um, that in addition to the anti-mortem genetic material of any microbes present during life, ancient metagenomes almost always contains at least some post-mortem DNA from the necrobiome or the microbes that are contributing to decomposition. So you're going to have kind of multiple microbiomes always operating uh, in any particular ancient sample that you're going to be looking at. Ancient metagenomics is a lot like regular metagenomics, but it's harder in many ways because other environmental microbiota of various ages are mixed in because the ancient DNA is uh, uh, degraded. All right, so let's use a metaphor here to kind of put this into perspective, like what it means to be doing ancient metagenomics. So I talked about yesterday how trying to put together an ancient bacterial genome is like the worst puzzle in the world, right? So it's not your standard 500 piece or 1000 piece jigsaw puzzle. It's like taking these DNA pieces and putting together at huge scale. So a typical bacterial genome is broken up over time into about 60,000 pieces, and we need to put that back together computationally. And that would be true if we were only focusing on a single genome, but as I mentioned yesterday, bacteria don't conveniently grow in pure colonies just waiting for us to reconstruct that one bacterial genome. They're always existing in this broader soup of DNA, either a microbiome with many, many species of other microbes or with a necrobiome or some other uh, contribution. So you can think about it more instead of just as a puzzle, like an entire puzzle shop where you have lots of different sources of DNA. So you might have uh, one of your puzzles that's there might be the human genome. Uh, another one might be your Cinea pestis. And then the whole thing is all the other puzzles that it's mixed up with. So you're not just reconstructing one puzzle, even if you're only interested in one puzzle, you still have to grapple with all the others that are mixed in. But it's even worse for ancient DNA because not only is the DNA fragmented, not only do we have many different genomes that we have to then put back together, it's as if someone has also thrown away all the boxes. So we don't know what the pictures should look like. We don't know how many puzzles there are, and we don't even know if they're all complete. So these are some of the big problems we have to grapple with. All right. So that's one way of looking at it. I want to offer another metaphor. This is my coral reef metaphor uh, of ancient metagenomics. So we know that the coral reefs are this incredible ecology, right? So they're a good analog for thinking about microbial ecologies. So lots of different species that are interacting in this environment and creating this kind of uh, whole, this, uh, this biome. Um, and uh, my favorite fish, the parrotfish, plays a really special role in coral. They chew up coral and they, uh, let's see here, they poop out sand. So this is how our nice sandy beaches are made. They're all made from parrotfish poop, but they eat the coral, they eat these reefs, and then they poop out the sand. And um, this can also be seen as a kind of metaphor here. So we can think of, if we think of the coral reef as everything in the past that we want to reconstruct, this vibrant ecology that we're really interested in, and we can think of that parrotfish as time, breaking it down into tiny pieces, then this is our ancient DNA. So this is what we're working with, and we're trying to get back to that, uh, reconstructing that coral reef. So I call this my parrotfish metaphor of ancient metagenomics. This is kind of what we're working with here. Um, but and the tools that we use to try to put this back together, we can use tools in the lab and tools also computationally to try to take what's left, this ancient metagenomic DNA that's highly fragmented and damaged, and to use that to try to reimagine and reconstruct this once vibrant community. And you might be thinking now, like, dear God, how is all of this possible? Are we going to be able to do this? You might be getting rather <laughs> fatigued even thinking about it but stick with it. We can do it. We have a lot of powerful techniques that allow us to um, go from this highly degraded material back to this original ecology.
All right, so today we're going to talk about how do we get started in working with this ancient metagenomic DNA? What's the pathway we're going to take in order to start to reconstruct this, this ancient uh, microbial ecology? And what sorts of questions should we ask along the way? So the very first question that we usually ask when we have a new data set of ancient metagenomic DNA is who is there? What microbes are present? The next question we usually want to ask is, okay, well, how preserved is my sample? Is this something where it's all decomposed? We have a complete composting effect and all we have is environmental bacteria, or do we still retain that original signal of that, uh, that ancient ecology? Um, we almost always have some degree of contamination, whether that's modern contamination or ancient uh, bacteria participating in decomposition, you're always going to have some microbial sequences there that are not from the original system you're interested in. And we have tools that we can use to clean that up to basically separate that out or quantify it so that our analyses will be based on the ancient signal we're looking for and not on the, these extraneous uh, sequences. And so from that, we're going to get to our microbial community that we're trying to reconstruct. And so these are the things I'm going to cover today in my lecture. And then for the rest of the course, you're going to have other topics that will help you uh, dig into this further. So on Thursday, you're going to explore the genomes that are present in these ancient microbial communities. You're going to look also at uh, assembly. Um, you might have something very particular you're looking for, maybe a pathogen that will also be covered on Thursday. And on Friday, we're going to dig deeper in. Can you trust it? Can you trust these reconstructions? How do you authenticate your, your genome reconstructions or your ancient DNA to have confidence that you really are reconstructing something ancient? All right. So let's start with this first question of who's there? How do we do this? So at the most basic level, the first question we're going to ask is, who is present in this community? But before we get to that, we have to revisit a really fundamental concept, and that is, what even is a microbial species? And this is not straightforward, and there's a lot of debate about what a species actually means for an organism that does not reproduce through sexual reproduction. So the original species concept was that's used broadly used today, although in modified form, but it forms the basis of the modern definition of a species, was developed by Ernst Mayer. Uh, he called it the biological species concept. He developed this in 1942, and he developed it on birds. So our kind of current conception that you probably grew up with in biology about, you know, a species can't interbreed with other species. So being able to interbreed with other members of the same species helps to define that species. There's lots of other factors that define a species. Um, these all come out of studies of birds, and microbes are pretty different than birds. Um, and so how do we adapt this concept to microbes? You might notice something, uh, one of the last uh, major works that he published was in 1970, uh, refining the concepts of species in birds in Melanesia. Does anyone notice anything uh, eye-catching about this Birds of Northern Mes Melanesia publication? Maybe in the author list? Recognize any names there? Maybe you guys can see it. Oops, oops. Uh, Jared Diamond was actually his co-author on that. That's Jared Diamond of Guns, Germs, and Steel fame. That was early in Jared Diamond's career. Um, he is actually an ornithologist by training. Just a fun fact. All right. Okay. So let's talk about how we might apply this to a microbial species. So this is a phylogenetic tree um, for two groups of bacteria called Tanarella and Porphyromonas. These are two uh, genera uh, of or genus of bacteria that live in the oral cavity. They're really important parts of the oral microbiome. And there's two components here that I want you to pay attention to. One is taxonomy and one is phylogeny. Taxonomy refers to how we name it. So everything colored here in this kind of bluish green, we call Tanarella, and that's its taxonomy. Everything that's colored in red, we call Porphyromonas, that's its taxonomy. Ideally, the taxonomy, the names we use for organisms, should reflect their phylogeny or their evolutionary relationships. Those evolutionary relationships are represented in this tree where we 
produce a model of how closely related these different members are. Here, the taxonomy and the phylogeny agree. Organisms that have the same name all are clustering onto the same branches and they have phylogenetic coherence. So here we have agreement between taxonomy and phylogeny and that's really the ideal situation that we want. We want our taxonomy to follow the phylogeny. Now, one of the problems, however, is that the way we reconstruct these phylogenies is using genetic sequences for microbes. Unlike for birds, we can't take traits like beak length or body size or plumage coloring to create traits to reconstruct a phylogeny. For microbes, we really have to look at their genetic sequences in order to reconstruct these phylogenetic trees. And that has only relatively recently become possible. So many of the microbes that were originally studied beginning in the late 19th century were given a taxonomy without really a very uh, sophisticated understanding of their phylogeny. So it turns out that a lot of the older species that have been studied for a long time or the species that have a long history of study, um, their phylogeny and their taxonomy are in conflict. So, whoops. So here's an example here on the right is a, a phylogenetic tree of a really important group of bacteria that have a lot of medical significance. It's a group that was also named quite a long time ago before we had sophisticated genetic sequencing. And so we have here uh, Klebsiella in orange, Salmonella, which is a group that causes a lot of uh, gastrointestinal disease in purple, Escheria, our famous E. coli is shown in pink, and green shigella, another famous uh, bacteria that causes uh, gastrointestinal disease is shown in green. Now these different groups were defined early on based on microbial culturing from individuals that had diseases. Uh, each one of them has a different kind of disease pathogenesis or a different disease course. And so clinically they were, um, they were viewed as being different. We now know that has to do with different virulence factors that certain members of these groups have. However, if you look at the phylogeny, it is not phylogenetically coherent. So Salmonella does form a monophyletic group. So all of the members of, oops, I need my pointer here. All of the members, doo -doo -doo, there we go, of Salmonella form a single monophyletic group. However, Escheria and Shigella do not. They're fully interleaved. So really, there's no reason to consider these different species. They are fully overlapping here. We also have one species over here, which has been called the Shigella, but is clearly falling completely among Klebsiella and is probably misnamed. And actually, the entire diversity of Salmonella and Escheria and Shigella falls within the broader diversity of Klebsiella. So if we were to use modern techniques of, tax, of, of, of basing our taxonomy on uh, phylogeny, we would actually call all of these as being members of the same genus. We would call it all Klebsiella. Or what we might do is break up Klebsiella into three groups, perhaps one group here and call this Klebsiella, rename this group, and rename this group. But this is, a, this is actually extremely common within microbiology and especially for pathogens that have been studied for a long time where you will have um, disagreement between taxonomy and phylogeny. And this is something you need to keep in mind when you're doing your analyses. Otherwise it can lead to a lot of confusion. All right. So one of the things you may have noticed here is that when we apply a species concept to microbes, it's kind of a fuzzy definition. Uh, we can't base it on the same criteria we use for mating birds. And so we have a kind of provisional definition of what a species is and what other levels of taxonomy mean that should be based on phylogeny. They aren't always. That's why microbes are also routinely renamed. So every few years, entire groups of bacteria get completely reorganized and renamed. And that's something you need to be aware of as you trace the literature. So for example, Tanarella, which I mentioned before, has been renamed at least three or four times. 
Um, it's had different genus names. It's had different species names. So you need to be able to understand that history if you want to look in the literature. If you don't realize that, you might think there's only three or four articles written on the species when in fact there are hundreds. They're just under different names. So that's something you can check online to see the history of naming for particular organisms, and that can be really important. A good example was just a couple of years ago, the entire group of lactobacillus, one of the oldest studied groups of bacteria because they're the dominant group that grow in fermented foods and have been studied since the 19th century, were completely reorganized and renamed, and nearly all of the members now have new names, and there's many new genera. So they broke up that genus into many genera. Clostridium difficile was the famous cause of C. diff was also renamed into Clostridioides difficile because it bears actually very little uh, relationship to Clostridium, the other members in that group. So there are frequently these reorganizations. And so we have this kind of fuzzy concept of a species in bacteria. Nevertheless, we are going to use the kind of standard biological taxonomy that is used for eukaryotes in order to classify our microbial species. Um, so we have here species, genus, family, order, class, phylum, and domain, with domain being the most broad and species being the most specific. And here I've just shown that um, for uh, Capnocytophaga gingivalis. Um, this is a common oral bacteria. And in many of your programs, you will see many databases organize uh, taxonomy in this particular way, where you have a, uh, an abbreviation like D for domain, underscore, and then the name and so forth. So you'll see these strings of taxonomy in many of your databases. This system we have to thank uh, for a couple of people. We can thank the two Carls for uh, our system here. So it was originally developed by Carl Linnaeus in 1753. He came up with the idea of binomial nomenclature and used uh, genus and species to start naming things in the natural world. Um, over the next couple of centuries, this got expanded to include families, orders, classes, and phylums. Um, by the late 19th century, those were all present. And the very last member to join is Domain. And this was coined by another Carl, Carl Woese, in 1990 uh, to refer to um, these huge groups of the domains of life, eukaryotes, bacteria, and archaea. We'll come back to this in a minute. So you can thank the two Carls for our taxonomic system that you'll be using. So if we want to look at who's there, how do we actually do this at a practical level? How do you go from raw DNA sequences to a taxon table with these taxon strings? So we use something called a taxonomic profiler, and you have several options available for you, for you here that use different strategies. Some are what are called alignment based. So you're actually aligning your sequences to a reference genome um, and matching up the different uh, bases in that sequence. There's several ones that are available. So for example, Chime was one of the earliest ones to be developed. And this was developed for aligning uh, 16S ribosomal RNA marker genes. Metaflon uh, is also an alignment based approach. Um, and it uses a marker gene set, so not just one gene, but a panel of different genes that have a high degree of discriminatory pattern uh, power for uh, taxonomy that you're going to use to do the profiling. And then you also have tools like MALT, uh, which is, uses read alignment and binning to try to look at all the reads, not restricted to a single set, to do uh, taxonomic assignment. There's a fundamentally different approach. Uh, it's an alignment-free braced approach. Um, they're often based on Kamer matching, and a good example of this would be Kraken. And we'll come back to these also later in the talk. But let's start with the classic approach to this. Um, the earliest attempts to really look at the complexity of microbial communities uses use the 16S ri ribosomal RNA gene and uh, developed into a, a kind of technique called amplicon metataxonomics. Let's take a look at this. It's not no longer used very much today, uh, especially not in ancient metagenomics, but it's really important to understand where the field came from. So amplicon metataxonomics of the 16S ribosomal RNA gene um, was used because it has a lot of great features. The 16S uh, ribosomal RNA gene is ubiquitous among prokaryotes. So both members of archaea and bacteria universally have this gene. 
it is basically uh, the gene that produces the RNA that allows the ribosomes to function. So every cell will have these. Many other genes are not shared across all of these members. They're specific to, to different groups or clades. This is one of the very few genes that's universal amongst prokaryotes, which makes it really good for then taxonomically classifying unknown mixtures of these organisms. Um, a lot of people don't understand what 16S means. Uh, it stands for 16 Svedberg units. That's what it stands for. And it has to do with the density of the RNA and where it partitions when you spin ribosomes in a really fast centrifuge. The ribosome itself, this is the prokaryotic ribosome. It has 70 Svedberg units. So that's how far it will travel within a particular mixture of heavy liquids if you centrifuge it really fast. And if you break it up into its component pieces, it has a small subunit, which is 30S, and a large subunit that's 50S. It's true if you add them together, they do not equal 70, but that's because this is not something based on addition, it's based on empirical measurements related to density. The small subunit is composed of a mixture of RNA and proteins, and the large subunit is also composed of a mixture of RNA and proteins and also tRNA. The small subunit contains the, the 16S, uh, the 16 Svedberg unit, rRNA, and it's a particular unit of RNA that's about uh, 1,540 nucleotides long. The key thing to know about this RNA is that it's partially double-stranded. So this is not RNA that is helping to, um, it's not messenger RNA, it's ribosomal RNA. It has a very particular function. So it's an interesting form of RNA that has a secondary structure that we'll look into. What's important about this 16S ribosomal RNA, which is encoded by the 16S ribosomal RNA gene, very creative, I know, is that if you stretch out this gene that's 1,500 bases long, there's parts of the gene that are extremely conserved, meaning there's very little sequence variation across all of the species within the prokaryotes. And then there's areas where they have lots of variation. So this is plotting variation on the y-axis and the the gene is rolled out on the x-axis, and these variable regions are labeled V1, V2, and so forth. There's nine variable regions within the 16S gene where you have high amounts of variation among species, and these can be used as barcodes. So what you can do is you can do PCR amplification. You can lay down primers on those really conserved regions and then amplify up the middle, and you can use that gene sequence within the, between those um, very, those conserved regions um, as a kind of barcode. So this gene sequence is used as a kind of barcode. And so people refer to this also as meta barcoding. You'll see that used interchangeably with meta taxonomics. There's different profiles that have been specifically developed to look at these sequences, including mother, RDP classifier, chime. They have the advantage of having enormous databases like the Silva databases, which contain um, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of sequences, and it's relatively efficient and inexpensive from a laboratory point of view because you're only amplifying up one gene with an inexpensive PCR reaction, and then you can pool lots of samples and analyze lots and lots of sequences. For a long time, this was really widely used for modern DNA, and it still is uh, used quite extensively uh, for modern DNA. Okay. As a little bit of an interesting history here, um, it is the 16S ribosomal RNA sequences. They were what led Carl Woese to discover in 1990 that archaea are a new domain of life. Oops, so there's like a little delay here. So before we just had bacteria, if I can come over here, before we just had bacteria and the eukarya and using, a, uh, using 16S ribosomal um, uh, RNA gene sequencing, he was able to identify archaea, an entirely new clade of life. And because now we didn't just have two groups, we had three, it necessitated having an entirely new taxonomic uh, level, which he called the domain. So now we have three domains of life, bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. You may be wondering where viruses fit into all of that, and there's no answer to that question. Uh, we don't, there's a lot of debate as to whether or not viruses belong in the tree of life, or and if they did, where they would go. So we're just going to leave viruses outside of the tree of life for now and say there are three domains. All right. 
And what's fun is that this uh, domain, this archaea domain, it is not trivial. I mean, archaea are really important. Originally, they were discovered in really extreme environments like hot thermal hot springs but actually there are uh, members of archaea that live in your own body so two famous members of archaea are methena brevibacter oralis which lives in your dental plaque and methena brevibacter smithii which is very common in feces so if you're working with ancient dental calculus or paleofeces you're very likely to see these members of archaea all right but the 16S ribosomal RNA marker gene has some really serious problems for ancient DNA. So because we're using short read sequencers, we can't amplify up the whole gene, all 1,500 bases. And that wouldn't work anyway for ancient DNA because ancient DNA is much shorter than that. But even for modern DNA, because they're using short read sequences, they typically only target one of these variable regions at a time. So the V3 region is a good region. It is the shortest variable region that still has good taxonomic discrimination across many groups of bacteria, but there's some problems with it. One is that it's length polymorphic. So the V3 region is longer in some groups of bacteria than it is in others. And here you can see a plot of different V3 sequences. So some are really short and they're around 160 bases. Some are longer and they're around 170 bases. And some are longer still and they're over 200 bases. And this varies by taxonomy, which is a real problem for us. If you average it all together, the, the length of the V3 region is on average about 180 base pairs long. Um, and so you can see here, um, if this is length of DNA, the average length of the V3 region here is about 100, a little over 180 bases. Um, and these are the measured uh, lengths of different uh, ancient DNA uh, um, from dental calculus. And so you can see that the PCR target we would be going for if we wanted to amplify this is falling in the tail of the, dis the length distribution. It's it's too long for most of our DNA. So the vast majority of ancient DNA in a sample is simply too short to ever amplify because you can't land both primers on the same uh, DNA template because it's just too short. It's been too fragmented. So that's a major problem. And the fact that it's also length polymorphic means you're going to disproportionately amplify better the ones that happen to have shorter uh, uh, V3 regions and the ones that have longer V3 regions. And then it can introduce a systematic artifact of underrepresenting taxa that have long V3 regions. All right. So since 2015, we have known that 16S ribosomal RNA ampl amplicon metataxonomics cannot be used for ancient microbial DNA. It is possible to analyze 16S RNA sequences within metagenomic data, so total shotgun data sets, but that's actually not a great approach. 16S ribosomal RNA sequences represent less than 0.05% of sequences. So it's really efficient to try to fish them out of metagenomic sequences. And also classifying these very, very short 16S ribosomal RNA sequences when they're randomly produced is quite error prone and can lead to a lot of false taxonomic assignments. So what we now do and have done for many years now is recommend alternative approaches um, using metagenomics. So goodbye 16S RNA sequencing. We appreciate your contributions to biology. All right, so now let's talk about the workhorses here that we use in ancient metagenomics. This is going to be Metaflon, Malt, and Kraken. So Metaflon is a marker gene set. Uh, uh, it uses a marker gene set. So Metaflon is a taxonomic profiler. It uses short read DNA sequencing data and a, a database of marker genes that are highly specific to certain clades. The marker database contains over a million markers um, found in bacteria, archaea, and micro eukaryotes. And it's had several iterations. So the very, very first published by Nicholas Sagata in 2012, and then Metaflon 2 came out in 2015, and these are now retired. We don't use either of these anymore. Uh, Metaflon 3 came out in 2021, and that's a great one. It's still used quite widely. And there's also now Metaflon 4, which was published in 2023. So these two are still in common use. The difference between them is Metaflon 3 only has bacteria that have um, genomes uh, sequenced from culture, whereas Metaflon 4 now incorporates metagenomically assembled genomes 
or MAGS. And Metaflon 4 has by far the largest database of bacteria feeding into these um, uh, marker gene sets. So Metaflon 4 has 236,000 genomes from cultured bacteria and 771,000 reconstructed metagenomically assembled genomes. And you can access these tools and these databases in the BioBakery. So let's talk a little bit about their pros and cons. So the pros of Metaflon is that it uses metagenomic data. So it works really well with, with ancient DNA. So you're using short read data and short ancient DNA. It's computationally efficient. Um, the marker database is really good for things like pathogens and the human microbiome. However, a few drawbacks, because it uses a defined marker database, it has really low customizability. So you're really dependent on whatever database they provide to you. If you have special taxa of interest that are not in that database, there's not very much you can do about that. Um, the marker database is mixing taxa that are relevant for some other animal microbiomes or environmental DNA. They're simply not present because they're not in the database. It will also only profile uh, microbes. And so you're not going to be able to look at your, your animal or plant DNA or other things that you might be interested in that might go along with your microbiome if you're studying something like pottery residues or feces. Overall, it's a good option if you're doing human-associated ancient micro, uh, microbes or microbiomes. Um, it was developed by Curtis Huttenhauer and Nicholas Agata, and they have actually innovated a lot of really useful microbiome software tools. So other tools that they have together or independently developed include Phyloflan, which you can use to do phylogenetic profiling of genomes and mags, Panflan for pan-genome strain level analysis, human for functional profiling, um, and they're also really expanding available microbial reference genomes through large-scale metagenomic assembly projects, which you'll hear more about on Thursday. Um, some examples of some of their recent publications are in 2020, they published 150,000 new mags, and in 2021, 200,000. So it's really growing at enormous speed. All right. Let's take a look at MALT. So MALT uses read alignment and binning. It was developed by Daniel Hewson and Alexander Herbig. Uh, it's a short read DNA sequence aligner for metagenomic data. Um, and it's integrated into the Megan or Metagenome Analyzer software suite. So you can actually inspect these data using a graphical user interface, which many people find to be helpful. Um, MALT itself is an acronym for Megan Alignment Tool, MALT. So you might notice a theme here with the Sagata lab, everything's kind of bakery themed. And with malt, we're going to kind of move into more brewing themes. Um, this, is how, this is how bioinformaticians have fun. Um, it works similar to BLAST, uh, but it's much faster. Um, and it was really developed, uh, the motivation was it was developed as an, a DNA alternative to the very popular protein sequence aligner, Diamond. Um, and to be used in Megan. So Diamond is a really powerful tool. It's really widely used. The problem is, um, when you translate DNA into protein, you lose a lot of information because of codon redundancy. So um, what, if you have long DNA sequences, if you have sequences that are 200 bases long or more, which modern, uh, which you have for modern metagenomics, that's not going to cause a problem for you. And you can really uh, speed up computational analysis by doing that transition. For ancient DNA, our DNA is so short, we cannot afford to lose any information. So if you translate your DNA into protein sequences and then try to use taxonomic classifiers, you'll introduce a lot of serious errors and we don't recommend doing it. And so MALT was really developed as a solution for this to take the popular tool Diamond, which uses protein sequences, and instead to make something similar that will work on the native DNA sequences that would be useful for ancient DNA. So um, the way that MALT uh, works is it uses all of the DNA in a data set to perform taxonomic assignment by aligning to a reference database, such as NCBINR or RefSeq. You can pick any database that you want, so it has high customizability. You can make your own database. Um, however, because it's doing all of this alignment, it's very slow and memory intensive because it's looking at entire genomes, not just a small marker set but it does maximize all the data available in your sample. And you can also use it to look at animal DNA and plant DNA and virus DNA and anything that you want. The data maze, as I said, is fully customizable and can be used for all taxa, not just microbes. And it also has a nice feature of using the lowest common ancestor algorithm, which assigns each sequence 
sequence to a node in the taxonomy. So if you have a sequence that happens to be quite conserved and shared across many taxa, it'll move it higher up into the tree where it's more confident. So maybe it's a sequence that's shared by all species within the genus, so it'll place it on the genus node. Or maybe it's a really common sequence, like for example, part of the conserved region of the 16S, and it's shared by all bacteria, and it will put it at the bacteria node at domain. All right. And that reduces false positives. Some pros is that it's going to maximize the use of all of your data. It has good uh, database customizability. It can profile all the tax in a sample, not just your microbes. It has the Megan interface for quick data inspection. And it's integrated into the NFCore Eager pipeline that James um, developed. And it's compatible with HOPS, uh, developed by Ron Hubler, which you can use for pathogen screening. And because it produces alignments, you can easily create DNA damage profiles. However, it has some drawbacks as well. It is extremely computationally intensive with large databases. And as the number of sequence genomes increases, it's increasingly becoming infeasible to use this approach. Um, and it can be very buggy. Um, and so that's something that can be tricky. Um, the other, the last, the third really uh, widely used approach is based on Kamer matching and Kraken is the tool there that is uh, widely used. Um, it's a taxonomic profile that works by Kamer matching rather than alignment. Um, because there's no alignment step, this makes it much faster and computationally less computationally intensive than the alignment based profilers. Um, the database is also customizable and it can be used for all taxa, not, not just microbes, which makes it really powerful. It was developed by Derek Wood and Steven Salzberg in 2014, and they have subsequently added additional tools that um, correct for or account for certain uh, problems. So for example, um, to account for different genome sizes when calculating species abundance, uh, um, Bracken does this. So if you have a genome that is 13 megabases, our very large bacterial genome, or only one megabase, then you would still have, you might have just one cell of each, but you'll have very different number of reads. And so if you want to look at the proportion of actual cells, not just gene units, um, then Bracken can help you do that. Um, they've also really tackled the problem of false positives um, that Kraken has. Kraken does tend to have a really high false positive rate. Um, and Kraken Unique is a new tool that helps to really control that and uh, reduce the false positive rates. And they've also sped up the algorithm to work much faster and more efficiently using Kraken 2. So let's go over the pros and cons of Kraken. It's fast. That's one of its best features. Um, it can be used for any set of taxa, not just microbes. And it's really great for quickly seeing what's in your data. Um, the accuracy is good enough for most ancient microbiome studies. But if you're focused on ancient pathogens, you really have to do more validation. It has a tendency to have many pathogen false positives, in part because pathogens are so overrepresented in, uh, in, data, in databases. So watch out for this. Uh, if you put Kraken 2, if you use Kraken 2 to profile your sample, you're almost certainly going to return some really exciting pathogen results. You're going to have to do some further validation because of this known false positive problem. Cons can be prone to false positives. Um, it doesn't provide alignment data. So if you, to do authentication um, using damage analysis, you're gonna have to perform an additional um, uh, line of analysis that is alignment based to produce those. So it cannot give you damage plots. Um, let's take a look here. So we, could, we have done a lot of benchmarking and comparing different taxonomic classifiers and how they work on ancient uh, microbiomes. Uh, what's come away from this, this is a study, for example, by Irina Velsko, and there have been subsequent ones as well, is that no taxonomic profiler is perfect. This is true for modern DNA, and it's true for ancient DNA. None of them are perfect. Um, they all tend to have problems with false positives um, to differing degrees, but the good news is they tend to be in the really low abundance taxa. So um, removing singletons or low abundance taxa can dramatically reduce your false positive problem. Uh, taxonomic profilers overall generally return broadly similar results, but there are some predictable biases um, from different classifiers. So the one, the thing that actually affects their performance the most is database selection. They also all use different databases, and that's largely what's driving a lot of the differences. Um, the database selection impacts the precision and the accuracy of these taxonomic assignments. So 
one of the most critical steps that you do during your study will be selecting the profiler and the database for your study. So let's talk about databases. Databases, 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 they matter a lot. Many databases are incomplete, and so you won't find what you can't see. So you need to always check your database to make sure it has your taxa of interest. So for example, the first generation Metaflon database lacked the species Tanarella forsythia, this really key oral microbe. And so this common oral microbe would disappear if you analyzed with Metaflon. So you would analyze with malt and it would, you would have some number of Tanarella forsythia, super exciting. You could reconstruct the genome from it even. You'd analyze with Metaflon and it would disappear. It would be like not there. And that's because it didn't have Tanarella forsythia in its database. Um, the newer versions, so Metaflon 2 and 3, and of course 4, have now fixed this, and so this problem no longer occurs. But it's instructive of the kinds of problems you might encounter. You need to always check your databases. If your taxon is missing from a reference database, or a reference genome in the database, your DNA may still align to something that'll align to the next best thing, and this will cause a false positive. We saw examples of this, for example, if you try to do taxonomic profiling of dental calculus prior to 2012, um, you would very frequently return high amounts of the skin pathogen Propionobacterium acnes, um, and this would come up very commonly in these data sets. After the genome of the related oral species, Pseudopropionobacterium propionicum, which has subsequently been renamed again, so this is a great example of renaming, it's now arachnia something, um, that was published in 2012. And now after that, if you would profile these data sets, the P acnes would disappear because they would all be assigned to propiona, uh, propionicum, which is the actual oral member that's in the mouth. Um, and as I said, nomenclature and renaming can be very cute, confusing. So uh, P acnes itself was also recently renamed. So in 2016, um, the propiona bacterium group was broken up because it was not phylogenetically coherent and P. acnes was renamed as cutie bacterium acnes. I think that the microbiologists, who was not a teenager, thought they were being very cute and funny by renaming this terrible, terrible bacteria. All right. Um, so the other thing to know, and James touched upon this on the first day, is that databases contain a lot of junk DNA. So genomes in NCBI, even RefSeq genomes contain errors, and sometimes they contain big errors. So as we talked about before, the common CARP, Cyprinus carpio genome is full of Illumina sequencing adapters, such that if you accidentally have any Illumina sequencing adapters still in your uh, data set that didn't get removed, you will identify them as CARP. Another persistent problem is the Tibetan antelope. I'm not entirely sure what is wrong with this genome, but Panthelops hodgsoni turns up in every single metagenomics data set. So if you search any dental calculus data set, you will always return Tibetan antelope. The Tibetan antelope is not present in the dental calculus. There's something wrong with that genome, which is causing mismapping of, of reads. And even the RefSeq genome of the common soil bacterium, Acromobacter denitrificans, contains an entire chicken ovalbumin gene. I'm not entirely sure that how that happened, but the entire chicken ovalbumin gene can be found in that RefSeq genome. So a really key thing here, I realize that things like AI and uh, chat GPT are becoming very prominent, but the bottom line is your brain and your critical thinking skills are your best defense against bad databases, bad data, and wrong conclusions. So I encourage you at all steps to do a kind of sanity check on your results. Does this make sense? Could there be another explanation? And when in doubt, check and double check because many of these different algorithms and approaches can introduce errors if you're not careful. All right, so now we have covered who's there. Let's move on to the next question. Uh, but before that, let's acknowledge, wow, that was a lot of work. You might be exhausted now and think, I don't think I'm gonna make it to question two, but we can do it. Let's go to how preserved is my sample? Give you a glass of water and we'll carry on. All right, so let's talk about metagenome composition and quality. 
There are several different causes of degradation and sources of contamination. So one can be the burial environment itself, which is going to contribute the necrobiome, which is going to partially decompose your sample. You're also going to have post-mortem microbial overgrowth. Some of the microbes that are actually originally present in your ancient sample won't die at the same time that the body dies, and they may continue to grow and even proliferate after death. So you might get this post-mortem microbial overgrowth of these microbes, these endogenous microbes. Um, and then you can also introduce uh, different uh, microbes through post-excavation handling and storage. So that could be transfer through handling with ungloved hands or a lot of storage facilities have some serious problems with like mold colonization. Uh, software tools can help you characterize your data sets preservation state and potential levels of contamination. There's uh, a couple different strategies that we commonly employ. One is source tracking and the other one is cleanup. And I'm going to talk about four tools that we use for these source tracker, source predict, Cooper deck, and decontam. So um, microbial source tracking is uh, a really useful tool and you can use it using a couple different approaches. You can use Bayesian or machine learning methods to estimate to what degree your data derives from a particular microbial source or from multiple sources. The two main methods that are used, uh, Source Tracker 2, which was developed by Dan Knight's lab, and Source Predict, which was uh, developed by Maxine Bory, uh, who as of yesterday is now Dr. Maxine Bory. Uh, he defended his PhD and you will um, hear from him uh, later this afternoon. So for this, the user uh, provides reference metagenomes, so modern dental plaque or modern feces or modern soil as sources, and the tool then tries to estimate what proportion of your data set derives from one or more of these sources. So here's an example of what this looks like. So here's a source tracker two profile. It's blank, don't worry, I'm not showing it yet. But here, what we're looking at on the bottom is different dental calculus data sets. So all of those along the x-axis are lots of different uh, calculus samples that are taken from a variety of primates. And we've given it the sources that you see on the right. So uh, the source, uh, we have subgingival plaque, supergingival plaque, uh, the gut microbiome, skin, environmental control, sediment, and unknown. And if we then uh, do source tracking on these samples, we see um, a wide range. So we actually see some samples have an estimated very high proportion of microbes deriving from dental plaque. So these look really fantastic. We have the overwhelming majority of the ancient dental calculus microbes. Um, uh, the community really resembles modern communities of plaque. And then we have some where we have almost no uh, estimated contribution from dental plaque. And so these are very low quality samples. This is an indication that they're probably quite decomposed. We might be mainly capturing a necrobiome here. We may not want to go further with these samples. But in almost all cases, the reality is you get a gradient of preservation. So you need to decide and have a good argument for which samples you will carry forward and which you will not. Um, not all will have that high of a degree of preservation or variation. Um, so those samples before came from a really wide variety of contexts, um, ranging up to 100,000 years old. If you look at more recent time periods and also from more temperate regions, you tend to see much higher degrees of preservation. So calculus in general um, tends to preserve its microbial profile fairly well. Now here we're using a totally different color scheme, so you need to adjust your expectations. Here, modern calculus and subgingival plaque and super, super gingival plaque are colored in blues and greens. Um, and this is all dental calculus from Europe, from the 19th century and from the medieval period. And here, what you can see is the preservation is outstanding. Nearly every sample is showing greater than 75 or even greater than 90% um, resemblance to an oral microbiome source. So um, you will find some cases where you have really outstanding preservation and, and others you'll have much more variability. So in these uh, samples, we um, basically took almost every sample forward for analysis because the preservation was so consistently good across the set. All right. Um, source predict uh, works uh, similarly, but it is using machine learning algorithm instead and was really 
developed for a little bit of a different purpose. So with Source Tracker, what we wanted to know is I have calculus and it's from a human skeleton, but how much of that calculus is really, how much of that microbial DNA is really from an oral microbiome versus soil, right? So you have a mixture of microbiomes. Source Predict was developed for a different problem. It was uh, developed to understand, for example, if I have some paleofeces, what organism produced it, right? So paleofeces are very different from dental calculus. You might not know exactly who produced those paleofeces because it's not part of a burial. And so you need some help to, to, to do that. So Source Predict was developed um, specifically to look at paleofeces and then also in combination with another tool called uh, Copper ID. Um, it's integrated into that tool um, for using things like, can we identify human paleofeces and distinguish it from dog poop? Um, which turns out is actually a really important problem in the archaeological record because they're often commingled. And if you want to do a study of the evolution of the human microbiome, it's best to remove your dog poop samples uh, before doing that. All right. So in terms of tips for this, one of the most important things for getting good results from this analysis is to choose your sources widely, wisely. You need to have at least 10 data sets per source and you can use more. Um, one thing to know is dental plaque and dental calculus are have similar but actually distinct profiles. So you will get better results if you use modern dental calculus as a source than plaque. Um, also, uh, soil, modern soil is not a very good proxy for the necrobiome. What would be much better is actually to use some archaeological bone. You'll get better, um, more precise results for that as well, because only a subset of the microbes like to live in human remains, not the general ones found within soil. Another important thing to know, the category unknown will include two things. It's both the proportion of your data set that can be assigned, that cannot be assigned to any one of those sources that you gave it. And it's also the proportion that can be assigned to more than one source. So that unknown category is a mixture of two things, things that we don't know what they are, can't be assigned to a source, and things that can be assigned to too many sources. So just keep that in mind that that's what's driving your unknown fraction. All right, so we've seen how preserved our uh, sample is, but how do I clean it up? So once I've got this, is there something I can do to improve it? If I've now characterized it, I know I have some contaminant tax in there, what do I do about it? So this is a two-step process that we typically go through. Normally what we'll do is we will identify and remove samples that are very, very degraded. So if a sample is so degraded that there's almost no original microbiome signal left, it might not be worth going forward with at all. And so we use CooperDeck, which is a tool developed by James, um, to help us determine which samples are worth uh, going forward with. They have sufficient uh, preservation for any kind of community analysis. Um, and then once you have those, you still may have some trace levels of contaminants, even well-preserved samples that you'd like to get rid of so they aren't the things that are driving your patterns. Um, we can do, we can remove this low-level laboratory or soil contaminant taxa from your data sets using a tool called decontam. So here's some examples. Um, some samples, as I said, are so degraded and altered post-mortem that they are not worth analyzing and CooperDeck can help you identify them so that you can remove them from your analyses. So this is about removing entire samples. Um, so here is an example of a of Cooper deck on uh, profiling of your references. So here we have used multiple references here. So we have subgingival plaque, supergingival plaque, urban gut, rural gut, skin, environmental controls, and so forth. Um, they are marked in blue if they're passing and they're marked in red if they're failing. And so for this particular test, we were looking to whether or not the, the profiles um, had a strong oral signature. And basically what it's looking at is the proportion, it's looking, it ranks the microbes that are found within the system in order by abundance. And then it goes one by one and asks, is this a known member of the oral microbiome or not? And then it plots the number, uh, it plots that um, as a decay curve. Um, and that helps you to determine whether or not you think you have good preservation in your sample. So if we now apply the same technique to a bunch of uh, samples, uh, here we have some howler monkey uh, 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 dental calculus and all of our samples pass. Um, we have some gorillas that came from museums. Many of them had a good, well-preserved microbiome still, but some were too degraded. 
from having spent uh, a century in a museum without climate control, and so they're too degraded to move forward on. Um, same thing with, uh, for example, our chimpanzees. We had four different collections of chimpanzees we looked at. Three were great and they had good preservation. One was not, and some of the samples really had too low preservation to move forward on. Neanderthals, mixed bag, some excellent, some very poor preservation, um, and so forth. So this allowed us to pull out of these different data set samples that we thought were too degraded or too altered by the necrobiome in order to move forward on. Um, once you've removed the samples that you think are too degraded, you want to clean up those that you're keeping and you can use decontam. This is kind of like a surgical removal of contaminants. Um, the samples themselves are okay, but they have some stubborn contaminant tax that you may want to remove. Um, some people have done this manually. They'll just happen to recognize, oh, that's a soil bacteria and they'll remove it from their data set. But that's not a very systematic way of going about it and certainly not reproducible. So um, we need a more systematic way of doing it. And it's also important to take them out because if you leave them in, these contaminant taxa could bias or skew your diversity patterns, leading to spurious results and false conclusions. So decontam will help you identify these obvious contaminants and remove them. And what you basically do is you'll provide them with data sets of your contaminant sources. So you might give it your library blanks uh, or your archaeological bone, and it will then pull all of those taxa um, out of your samples. Um, this can be really important. Archaeological bones should be sterile during life, so all of the microbes that are accumulated um, should be contaminants on the kinds of contaminants that are likely to affect your calculus. As a caveat, you should not use dentin for this because in about 20% of cases, the dentin is actually primarily decomposed by oral bacteria. All right, and so this will remove these contaminant taxa. All right, so you've cleaned up your data set. Now you've got your microbial community. What are you going to do with this amazing thing you've reconstructed? So usually what we like to do with these microbial communities is at first get a sense of their diversity. So within ecology, there are many ways to examine um, microbial communities in order to better understand them. And the two that are the most common and are standardly applied are looking at the alpha diversity and beta diversity. So the alpha diversity measures the variation uh, within a single sample. So, um, but one thing to keep in mind, this is important, alpha diversity is easily skewed in ancient samples by the preservation of trace contaminants. So you have to be very careful when interpreting ancient alpha diversity. If you still have contaminants left in your data set, that will completely blow out your alpha diversity. So use alpha diversity with a grain of salt. There's two different metrics or two different approaches looking at alpha diversity. You can look at species richness. Uh, one tool or one index you can use is the Chow One index is pretty common. Uh, that basically asks the question, how many different species are in my microbial community? You know, how many are there? Are there 10? Are there 1,000? Um, that's your species richness. You can also look at species evenness, and Shannon index is the most common one used for this. And this asks how balanced are the species in your community? Do you have 90% of one species and everything else is in the 10%? Or do you have 100 species that are each at 1%? So you're looking at the evenness of that distribution. This is important because we know different body sites and different microbiomes have very different levels of species richness and species evenness. So here you can see this is from the Human Microbiome Project looking at different body sites on the, on the x-axis. And the, uh, the level of diversity varies a lot. So for example, the oral microbiome actually has pretty high species richness, um, whereas other body sites it might, might be lower. Things like fermented foods are even lower still. Those might only have 12 species in them, whereas the gut microbiome and the oral microbiome will have well over 700. Beta diversity measures the variation between samples. And you can use a, several different approaches here. So one that's commonly used is Bray Curtis dissimilarity. And this asks the question, to what degree are taxa shared between my samples at the same abundances? So um, if, the, the, if you have a Bray Curtis score of zero, it means your two communities are exactly the same. And if you have a score of one, it means they're completely different. Uh, another tool you can look at beta diversity comparing your samples is the Jacquard distance. And this asks to what degree are taxa shared between my samples, and this ignores abundance. So if it's zero, you have exactly the same taxa in two different samples, and if it's one, you have completely different taxa. 
There's a third tool, which is really nice called Unifrac. And this actually takes in the, into account the phylogenetic relationships of these taxa. And you can run this uh, weighted or unweighted, so taking into account abundance or not. And this is really nice. So Bray Curtis will treat uh, Streptococcus mitis and Streptococcus salivarius like they're, they're as two different species, equivalent to if you had Streptococcus mitis and Clostridium difficile. Like it doesn't care what their phylogenetic relationship is. They're different species. It calls them different. Unifrac is different. It will notice that the actual path length between two members of Streptococcus is really small and huge between Streptococcus and Clostridium. And so it will kind of scale those distances based on that. You can visualize beta diversity of a given set of samples using principal coordinates analysis or a PCOA. And here's an example of a PCOA that's based on Bray Curtis distances of the microbial communities present in the human microbiome. And so you can see that samples, gastrointestinal samples, all kind of cluster together, oral samples cluster together, urogenital ones cluster together, and skin and nasals have a lot of overlap. They have a lot of shared taxa and a lot of shared similarity. Here's another example of a PCOA based on Bray Curtis distances of microbial communities present in archaeological samples, including paleophytes and dental calculus. And here you can see some interesting patterns. So you can see compositional differences between modern dental calculus and plaque, for example. So modern uh, dental calculus here and plaque. Um, and that ancient dental calculus, so modern dental calculus and pla uh, modern plaque. And then you can see ancient dental calculus overlaps the modern calculus. Um, there's the ancient. And you can also see that feces from modern industrialized populations and non-industrialized populations are actually distinct, which is something that's been known since around 2015, which is really cool. And that paleo feces uh, resembles uh, non-industrialized feces. All right. So what's the difference between PCOA and PCA? You might not have heard of PCOA. So PCOA stands for principal coordinates analysis, and it's applied to your distance matrix that you've generated Bray, Curtis, Jacquard, Unifrac, in order to visualize your beta diversity in a plot. Now, alternatively, you can also take an entirely different compositional approach, and you can transform your data in your taxon table using a centered log ratio transformation or a CLR in order to, and then you build a Euclidean distance matrix, and then you can perform PCA or principal components to visualize the samples in your plot. You must do this to run a PCA because a PCA can only be run on a Euclidean distance matrix. So which approach is better? Um, it's a bit of a philosophical debate, and there are very strong feelings, as you'll see on YouTube, about these. Um, but there's not one that's better than the other. They do different things. They have different pros and cons. They're both valid for metagenomics. They have different problems and different strengths. And they represent your data in slightly different ways. And I encourage you to try both. If you get similar results using both, that is a great uh, strength for your argument that you're seeing a real pattern. If they give you radically different results, you might want to try to find out what is causing that. The bottom line, this is the two approaches. Fundamentally, where they differ is they deal with zero count data differently. And they also have different ways of accounting for discrepancies in sampling effort. You can read more about the growing importance of compositional approaches to microbiome analysis in this recent review uh, by Glor et al. And if you want to know more, Pat Schloss, who created Mother, one of the early tools used to analyze 16S ribosomal RNA data, he has produced a series of YouTube videos about ecological analyses and distances, and he explains in detail how to use the R package vegan for microbiome analysis. And you can check them out uh, here. So just to recap now, we've gone from our ancient metagenomic DNA to who's there, how preserved is my sample, and how do I clean up my sample, my data set, to reconstructing a microbial community. And you're going to, for the rest of the course now, explore uh, how do you explore its genomes? How do you find something very particular you're looking for? And how do you, um, oh, that's a mistake there. How do you gain confidence in what you have reconstructed is real? And again, at the end of my slides, I've provided a bibliography where you can find many of the things that I'm referencing. And I encourage you to explore that later. And with that, I will stop. And thank you very much for your attention.